going to be honest with you from the get-go. Um, the request tonight was for Jefferson and, and me to get up here and give you our stump speeches. And you know what I mean, square up at the microphone, tell people how the city's making progress, why I'm excited to build on that momentum for another four years. But here's the challenge. As I look out across this room, I don't see a lot of people who are curious about what comes next. No, I see people in this room tonight as the architects of the new Indianapolis that's already under construction. In 2020, a global pandemic wreaked havoc in American cities as murder rates jumped to historic highs from coast to coast. No one was immune. But in this room tonight, I also see leaders from our Office of Public Health and Safety, who along with the men and women of IMPD, produced a 16% reduction in murders in Indianapolis just last year. Down by double digits again, as we prove that when you invest in mental health services, grassroots organizations, and fund the police department, at a historic level, you can become a national leader in crime prevention and crime avoidance. The pandemic didn't just drive up the murder rate. It also shut down activity from central business districts to convention centers in each and every city. But in this room tonight, I see the leaders from the NCAA, Visit Indy, the Capital Improvement Board, the Indiana Sports Corporation, all of whom helped ensure that while the rest of the country was reeling, we were leading the vanguard of recovery by hosting all of March Madness, the collegiate football championship game, and in just a few short months, we're going to host the best NBA All-Star game ever. <laughs> That's not all I see here tonight. I gave Adam some kudos, but I'd like you to join with me and give a shout out for the work of my partners at the Indy Chamber and Develop Indy. On Monument Circle, to the Pacers, Fieldhouse of the Future, to the new Convention Center, Signia Hotel, to the new downtown global headquarters of Elanco. Do you want me to keep going? <laughs> From the demolition of our old downtown jail to the repurposing of Jail 2 and the Arrestee Processing Center, to the redevelopment of the city market into the most dense, residential development in the state to preserving old city hall with a 21 C and hundreds of new apartments all the way to where I believe that we will win at 11 park. Speaking and God bless any candidate spouse that goes along with this. Hey, Abdul. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Abdul and I had the chance to, to run and compete together and when you can run and compete and emerge as friends with, with a fellow like Abdul, that's a great thing. I'm disappointed not to appear alongside Mayor Hogsett. That's not ego. It's just that until this year, the Hobnob was the signature mayoral debate in Indianapolis. And this change was made not at my behest. I would love to be uh, standing alongside our mayor. But this is the ground rule that he set uh, for this conversation. The mayor hasn't agreed to a televised debate. Multiple media outlets have requested that we take part in such a debate. I stand ready and eager to have that opportunity. But until, but until our mayor agrees, this won't happen. So maybe we can get him there. 
Now, I believe voters deserve the chance to hear from both candidates who aim to lead this city, and I'm looking forward to that. I also want to address up front the political climate in which we gather here tonight. This is uh, probably one of the more competitive mayoral races than we've seen in a few cycles, as it should be, because this is a big job, a lot of stuff on the line. India is a big city. Uh, we're big enough to have a mayor's race litigated with a lot of advertising. Maybe some of you have seen some of it. I've certainly had a hand in a few pieces. Uh, <laughs> But we're also a community that works and worships, lives, and raises our families together as neighbors. This isn't about the distant problems of Washington, D.C., even though some of the issues in this campaign have been nationalized. This is about our hometown. I suspect the mayor's unwillingness to stand with me here tonight is related to his advertising strategy. Notice his ads aren't principally about his record. They're almost all about me. And I suppose in maybe some sense I should be flattered by that. Small sense. <laughs> so in lieu of a proper debate, let's settle this. Joe Hogg's has core argument, near as I can tell about why I shouldn't be mayor, is that I'm a Republican. Well, I am. Lifelong, guilty as charged. So now let's, uh, we've covered that. Let's talk about Indianapolis. I entered this difficult race because we all live here and know that the energy in the city is not what it was but a decade ago. Our path toward leadership is driven by attracting intellectual capital to the hub of our capital city, to the hub of our state. Adam noted that I was on the Chancellor's Board of IUPUI. I have now served through three and a half chancellors, so I've been at this for a while. I'm a graduate of IU Bloomington and Purdue West Lafayette, but been very involved in IUPUI. Yay. Not a point of bragging, but the gateway there on West Street, the Street Gateway uh, uh, there, Mary and I had a hand in, and it supports scholarships for some Indiana kids at IUPUI, and we're, we, we're just so proud of that. Um, we're on the cusp of something special. We're gonna take IUPUI and create two freestanding Research One universities right here in the middle of our city. And the economic implications and amplification opportunity is the most important opportunity that I think our city will face over the next decade or two. It's so important that we get that right. In all of my meetings of the Chancellor's Board, <laughs> Mayor Hogshead, a graduate of IUPUI, never attended, never attended in, in, in my three and a half chancellors that I've served on that board. I, I, will, I will not only appoint someone at the cabinet level to be engaged in the mission of Purdue University Indianapolis and IU, Inter I, IU Indianapolis, I'm gonna turn it myself because it will be fun as we take two well-known academic brands and grow those Research One universities. It's an extraordinary, not unique, but extraordinary opportunity, and we must anchor these universities to Indianapolis's growth. These projects are rolling forward, and imagine what we can do as we take that hard tech corridor that President Mung speaks about from West Lafayette down to Indianapolis, and the STEM corridor that President Whitten talks about from Indianapolis down to Bloomington with Indianapolis at the epicenter of it, and we take 16 tech and the ability to leverage tech transfer and all the energy, the capital, the investment that we can bring into this city as we figure out how to make that work and for Indianapolis to truly stand out amongst cities once peer and those that have momentarily eclipsed us including Columbus, Ohio, where they have Ohio State University. I mean, we can get this back and we can turn this around and do some extraordinary things. I'm a real estate guy, I wanna build. But first is always the foundation. The foundation of a growing city is a safe city. We're gonna bring back the public safety director position. Sounds pedestrian. But every mayor of Indianapolis and Suliga has had an executive public safety director and man oh man do we need it. We need it because the job of mayor is big and broad and, and encompassing and we need that civilian executive leadership 
to help turn us around on these areas where we are stumbling mightily. We're going to hire more cops. Sounds like a simpleton approach, but we are at least 300 down. Uh, FOP chief uh, or elite president said we were 322 down and heading toward 400 down. There is no workaround from having sufficient numbers of police on our streets to deal with both public safety, uh, 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 private property, and just providing our citizens a place in which they want to lay their heads at night, let alone live here. That's the way our tax structure works. You got to live here and pay taxes to make this work. Um, I will pivot from recruitment to retention. High value officers in that five to 10 year period, uh, those are the talent that we most need in investigations. And friends, it wasn't a lifetime ago, it was just an administration ago that the saw rate on our homicides exceeded 80%. We're down in the 30s today. You can get away with murder in this city, and that is no way for our citizens to live. I will lobby our state legislature. They may not all like me, most of them know me. I will work hard to advocate for the interests of our city at that end of Market Street and to get some control over our gun laws. I am a gun owner, not a model NRA member, <laughs> but I believe in the essential right to responsible gun ownership. But right now, if a 19-year-old kid is walking down the streets of Broderickville at 3 a.m. with a Budweiser in one hand and a nine millimeter in the other, he's guilty of one crime, and that needs to change. Our cops need more tools, including some important ones that we took away from them last year. We know guns don't shoot themselves. I get that, I've heard that, believe me. And yet we have a serious revolving door problem. Right now, we aren't prosecuting reckless cases of, of, of weapons discharge. We should, this needs to stop. We can find the political will to do that. We can do that. And finally, finally, and perhaps most importantly in all this, we gotta address the root causes of crime in ways that we haven't yet. Whether they be uh, seated in food deserts, youth programs, mental health issues in our city. <laughs> our city council has begun wrestling with this budget, $1.6 billion. I've been through a half dozen budgets. This is a lot of work and God bless our council members. Dan Boost was just heading out to go to a meeting. 1.6 billion. Our city spends $2 million on this clinician-led response team. Good, noble start, but let's really invest in mental health and the root causes of crime if we're, going, if we're going to turn this one around. He ran as a crime fighter, but from his handling of the riots to the police staffing, to the lack of a core vision for our downtown, it's just not working. I quote, eight years is long enough to accomplish what you want to accomplish. Joe Hogsett, 2015, calling for term limits. After eight years, my friends, I was hopeful he could join the proud history of mayors and city leadership, but also Luger, Hunnett, Goldsmith, and Ballard, Republicans, yes, but Republican leaders of a certain type that I identified with. Forward-facing, inclusive, what used to be called civil rights Republicans. I don't like labels, but maybe we can bring that one back. My political thinking grows out of that tradition. I hope our success in this campaign can be a model for the future of a party to which I am committed and I'm aimed to bring about meaningful generational change to our hometown. In governing, a fresh set of eyes on stale problems can make all the difference.